afternoon, dear ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests. My name is Marta Smolikova, I am the director of Václav Havel Library. I would like to welcome you on the launch of Václav Havel European Dialogues project. Today we start this first event entitled The Citizens, Power and Democracy in Europe Crisis, the Conference. The Václav Havel European Dialogues is an international project that aims to initiate and stimulate a discussion about issues determining the direction of contemporary Europe by referring to the European spiritual leg legacy of Václav Havel. This idea takes its main inspiration from Václav Havel's essay, Power of the Powerless. More than other similar focus projects, the Václav Havel European Dialogues aims to offer the powerless a platform to express themselves and in so doing to boost their position within Europe. It is important to say that this conference is organized by Václav Havel Library, not for profit, non governmental organization, aiming to save and develop Václav Havel legacy. We don't follow any official state or European policy. We would like to create a platform to talk about our life. The library operates as a documentation center organized the digital archive, which consists in this time from 28,000 items, has documents, photos, videos, and other materials focused on Václav Havel as an artist, author, citizen, dissident, and president, mostly accessible via the internet. The Václav Havel Library published books and as the circle organized events oriented into the culture, philosophy, and politics. Like our readings, events, discussion, performances for various audiences. Those events are held in a space where a permanent exhibition about Václav Havel is presented, and those are visited not only by friends of Václav Havel, but by many students, academics, journalists, and young people. Create a space for open discussions and thinking was one of the main wish of Václav Havel. Besides various activities, the Václav Havel Library organized special, special projects, conferences focused on European topics, as well as federalism and Europe, or Europe and the Czech Republic in 100 years, or European identity and its Czech reflection. By this occasion, I would like to mention Basel Havel Human Rights Prize, established in partnership with Council of Europe last year. Great institution with strong history and respect in human rights field. As a part of the project, we organized the Prague International Conference and by the civic society, freedom is not to be taken for granted. This Human Rights Prize is open for nominations globally. The first winner was our spirit skip, Belarusian writer and resident. The deadline for this year's nominations is April 3rd. The Vastav Havel European Dialogues is planned as a long-term project and involves cooperation with other organizations in various European cities. Events in Bruges and Berlin are currently being prepared. Individual meetings, which take the form of a conference, are targeted primarily at the secondary secular students as well as specialists and members of the public interested in European issues. The first conference entitled The Citizen, Power and Democracy in the Europe Crisis we begin with two panel discussions. Europe and the Crisis of Democratic Capitalism and Reinventing the European Project. <coughs> in the conversation then continue focusing on the topic What Europe? What Democracy? And tomorrow program will be open with a session entitled Europe and the Limits of Civil Society from Consensus to Conflict Driven Policy. And last session, Federalism, the American versus European Way will bring the first ever Basel Cover European Dialogues for conclusion. Harris, I would like to thank to the European Commission representation in the Czech Republic, the Segrad Fund, European Parliament Information Office. Forum 2000 Foundation, Doc Center for Contemporary Arts, who made this conference possible. As well to my colleagues, Veronica Brazilova, Pavel Hayek, and external cooperators, Daniel Rexa, Adela Wolfova from Fox Hunting, and Daniela Redkova from Docs. 
for the organization of the event. To Jack Krupnik and Jan Makhanček, who as the members of the Vassal Hotel Library Board of Trustees help with the content of today and tomorrow program, as well for our foreign partners, Hungarian Europe Society from Bratislava, Stefan Batoy Foundation for Kat Parshal, Institute for Public Affairs from Bratislava, and International Education Debate Association based in Amsterdam. My big thanks to Pavel Seifer, who worked for Vaslo Havel during his presidential period and served as the ambassador in London. Pavel Seifer developed the idea of Vaslo Havel European Dialogues into the concrete project. And finally, I would like to thank to all our speakers. Dear ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, democracy in the Europe crisis is not only a part of the title of this conference, but very concrete sad fact. Just watching the tragedy in Ukraine, we feel really powerless. Just on the beginning of the conference, let me commemorate Václav Havel through his video speech, given in Kiev, exactly 10 years ago, on February 21st, <coughs> 2004, at the Conference of Ukraine in the Europe and the World. I wish you great two working days. You can start. Ukrajina je, abych 
takže k zájmové sféře tohoto světa a jak se rozhodne, po jakou cestu se rozhodne, je její věcí a toto její rozhodnutí by mělo být všemi, všemi respektováno. Já pevně věřím, že Ukrajina bude posilovat v nadcházející době svou nezávislost a že se dopracuje svobodně ke svému rozhodnutí o své budoucnosti. A věřím, že na této cestě jste pomohli i vy, účastníci této konference, mezi nimiž mám mnoho osobních přátel, které tímto zdraví. Dobrý den, dámy a pánové. Uh, dear everybody. I have good news for you. That is that the Doc Center is full to the roof. And the bad news is that whoever else wants to come in has no chance. Uh, we had a problem with uh, how to arrange talking in which language. Um, the rumor was that there's going to be a referendum and that the European language for all would be Czech. <laughs> but the referendum hasn't happened yet, so uh, we'll use English. And that, again, is a good news for for uh, France and French, because only English will be corrupted by all the Europeans. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yesterday, or was it the day before, Martin Luther uh, phoned me from, from Bratislava and said, how can we do this, have a conference? while people are being shot in the Ukraine. It was a marvelous idea of the library to, to show us this connection through times to Václav Havel directly. <coughs> I think the, the answer we don't have, but uh, the feeling of powerlessness is a very personal feeling for all those who are really interested in and find that they should be responsible for what's happening around. Um, the conference is only a beginning, a prelude to um, a series of dialogues which we hope will be open-ended and we'll tour from Prague to Bruges to Berlin to Warsaw to but no, to Sarajevo in the near future, and then on and on and on. There are 28 so far European countries, members of the European <coughs> Union. These dialogues, we want to happen in a way that connect discourses. Europe is actually, in a way, divided still into compartmentalized um, discourses. Uh, and as long as the discourses of the press, the politicians, and the public is uh, kept within a national boundary, the territory, uh, as long as this is the fact, it will be very, very difficult to proceed in a European way and solve crises one or the other. Uh, the, the great hope of the project is that there will be many young people who will join in and the form for that has been found in uh, debates, in the Vassar Havel European debates. 
And this is going to happen in debating clubs and associations throughout Europe. So that's the second form. Um, this conference, for me surprisingly, uh, attracted quite an interest. If we manage to stage more like this and make the whole dialogue project really interesting, then I think we've probably done a good job. We won't find the answers, but what we do want to find is a way to talk and in involve the citizen and the civil society in this, in this uh, uh, process. Because there it is missing. There starts this feeling of, uh, uh, of helplessness. When one doesn't know what to do, how to do, who, who to ask, who to tell something, and where. So my wish is that, the, uh, that this uh, project will help. I would now uh, like to ask uh, Jacques Rupnik to take over from me. Jacques uh, is, well, most of you know him. Uh, he's um, active in Paris, in, in Bruges, in other places, all around the, uh, the world actually. And uh, one of the places he chose to be at home is, is Prague, which is a good thing for us. Um, the, on the way of the dialogues, is also Bridge, where Jack is a professor, and uh, some later time I hope it will arrive in Paris as well. So, thank you, Papa. The idea of having a series of European dialogues, we imagined having them, you know, Paris, Berlin, etc., Sarajevo. Uh, very important. Uh, I think the next should be in Kiev uh, uh, and uh, conditions permitting. Um, but clearly this is where the European debate is uh, uh, heading and uh, you know there are conferences where you hear a word uh, uh, from our sponsor, there is no such thing, but uh, something like a word about our mentor, you've heard Václav Havel uh, on uh, the situation in Kiev. Uh, I will, what I will try to do very briefly, uh, just uh, to start our discussion, is to look at the way some of Havel's ID can be relevant to our, uh, our present crisis. Uh, you know, our nationalization crisis. You know, the famous Masarykian text, uh, uh, 1895, uh, Karakosik in 1968, Another famous text, Russian. Well, well, this is a theme uh, to which uh, uh, Czech intellectuals like to return. And I think that we are confronted with this double crisis a crisis inside the European Union, the very core, and we have the crisis at our periphery, at our immediate periphery. And this is a double challenge how to cope with this double crisis, with this double challenge. And I think that, you know, what's up, Havel had interesting things to say on both accounts. Uh, I, I meant to say more about Kiev, but you just heard him. Uh, all I can add is a conversation I had with him exactly at that time, February, uh, yeah, February 2005, um, which I published in, in, in the French Daily Le Monde. And it went something like this. <coughs> I asked him, is what you see in, in, in Kiev, is it, in, do you see this as a remake of 1989, the Velvet Revolution or something like that? He says, well, to the extent that you see people on the main square and that they're ready to stay as long as it takes for government to leave office, there is a parallel. However, there's a fundamental difference. 1989 was a revolution against communism. Orange Revolution is a revolution against post-communism. So I asked him, well, what, what then is post-communism? How do you define post-communism? He gave the briefest definition you can get. It's a mix of an authoritarian regime and mafia capitalism. Well, but it's short, but I think very, very, much, uh, uh, very much to the point. 
He then, of course, stressed the important role of Russia and said the main problem with Russia is that it doesn't know where it ends. It doesn't know where its borders end. And so long as you have this uncertainty, there can be instability, there can be conflict, etc. And uh, uh, the Ukrainian question, as he said, uh, is, in, is important uh, uh, in the way the regional grouping, the new map of Europe, uh, is being redesigned. It shouldn't be redesigned by force, but uh, by choice. It is uh, uh, in this sense, he said, that the, uh, I'm sort of paraphrasing, he didn't put it that way, but I, I would put it that way, that uh, uh, the Ukrainians, European question have now become Europe's Ukrainian question. And uh, 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 the, the answer to it should be uh, very much uh, left to the Ukrainians, what I think have a to then, and then we, when it was launching the European Partnership for Democracy, that was still a follow-up on that idea, that this, these crises on the periphery, they are tests of the capacity of Europe to project its values, to spread them in its neighborhood, to support democracy, and uh, uh, yeah, this is, should be seen as a test of Europe as an actor, and you know, we can leave it with a question mark. And I'm sure in the discussion at some point in our conference, we will uh, we will uh, uh, we will return to, uh, to to this. the The second question, uh, the second Havelian theme, I think, which which can be relevant for our uh, for our meeting here, is that um, is a question of uh, of civil society. Um, the European project has been very much an elite project. It has been carried for historical reasons, for understandable reasons, it has developed that way. It was an elite project, more or less uh, it was from above. What the dissident experience and what people like Havel and others uh, in Central Europe have contributed is the idea of uh, uh, a European dimension from below. That concerned the cooperation of Central European dissidents in the old days. Uh, but more broadly, this is what you could call the Helsinki effect, or what one could call the Helsinki from below. In other words, you had a, you had a, a European order based on stability and division, and you introduce the idea of human rights uh, as a, 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 a crucial issue in the East-West dialogue, in the diplomacy, and you introduce it through uh, 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 the uh, uh, dissident movements and the way they were acting. They have really recast, reformulated uh, the uh, Helsinki paradigm, uh, 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 and I think that this was the lasting legacy, that you cannot uh, have a European peace without uh, human rights. Uh, you cannot as it was the case in those days, you cannot have detente between East and West if at the same time you have Jaruzelski imposing a state of war, as it was called in Poland, where well, today we have state of war in, in Ukraine, if you want, there would be, uh, there would be the parallel. So, uh, uh, yes, the, uh, uh, the idea that we have a European market, we have European legal norms that we share, but we do not have a trans-European civil society. We do not have a European public space in the general form. And uh, that is a paradox. We had a, the paradox would be that before 1989, we had quite an intensive dialogue between East and West, intellectual and political, in conditions of unfreedom. So it was difficult. It was sometimes going in convoluted ways. But there was an engagement, an intellectual engagement. Paradoxically, I feel after 1989, we've lost that momentum. We are free to speak, we are free to meet, but uh, uh, we have been kind of content to do business as usual and avoid the burning questions, and sometimes they return with a vengeance like, uh, like in Kiev uh, uh, today. So uh, this would be, so to speak, the, uh, the, the second Havelian theme. You cannot have a European project that is sustainable in the long run if it is not built on European uh, civil society, if it doesn't have a shared 
European public space. And we can discuss in the conference what that can entail. The third theme, I must be uh, uh, brief, the third theme uh, uh, that is, uh, I think, a Havelian theme topical for our, for our situation today. We have seen in the Euro crisis, those who think this, things can unravel, and they can, or those who said, well, the answer must be the more intense integration, and we have seen the return of the federal question, the federalist specter returns to Europe, if you are. And uh, of course, the federal debate has been around in various ways uh, since the beginning. The founding fathers who believed in it but didn't want to say so, not to scare this would be uh, uh, rampant federalism, if you want. Then we had, in the midst of the financial crisis, our leaders uh, doing ad hoc solutions that pushed them in a federal direction but never said so. So this was kind of inadvertent federalism that the Mercosy couple performed on occasion. Now we are in a situation, we are at a crossroad, where really the question of, uh, 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 of uh, changing in a very important way the political system uh, uh, of the European Union is on the agenda. I'm saying it's on the agenda, I'm not saying we're heading there. But this is where uh, uh, Havel is interesting, because first he, he said, I have no problem with the idea of shared sovereignty. In today's world, this is a, 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 an obvious starting point, uh, uh, not just for small states like uh, 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 Czechoslovakia or the Czech Republic, but for, 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 for the rest of Europe in, in this globalized world. <laughs> what he had problem with is the idea that you lump together the threat against national sovereignty with threats to national identity. So in the Eurosceptic discourse, you always find these twins. Identity and sovereignty are threatened by the European public. So he would say, well, who's threatening our identity? Uh, 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 has, has anybody seen Portuguese identity being threatened by the European project? No. Uh, same thing for the Czech identity. So let's leave aside identity politics and let's discuss, but in an explicit manner, the question of the democratic legitimacy of the European project. And there he goes openly into the federalist mode in the 1990s when nobody was talking about federalism in Europe, uh, uh, he, was, he, he, he was the one. Uh, and uh, he made it among, uh, on several occasions, uh, uh, one that I remember very well, and uh, uh, I think uh, 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 Pavel Fischer was there as well in Paris when he made that uh, uh, speech in front of the parliament where he openly said, well, you know, what Europe needs is a constitution, he said, a short, concise text understandable to all, which would define the meaning of why we're doing it, why we're doing this project, and how the main competencies are defined. Something clear, short, understandable to all. You remember what, what we got? Thousands of pages of unreadable document that nobody read, and that ended up being rejected. Second thing he said, we need that, and we need a federalization and a parliamentarization of the European project. This is really uh, 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 where he said, yes, if we're going to have that federal project, it has to be democratic, it has to have democratic legitimacy. And he even suggested we should have two chambers, uh, 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 one European Parliament and a second chamber, which would be representative, for instance, from national parliaments, etc. I am not going, we will have that discussion tomorrow. I just wanted uh, that way to uh, suggest that the three Havelian themes I have mentioned are very much at the core of what we are confronted with today in this uh, 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 double crisis internal and uh, on our doorstep in, uh, in the Ukraine. And that uh, you may agree with me uh, that in looking at our present crisis, we can do worse than taking a leaf out of Václav Havel's book. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jack. <clears throat> I would uh, now uh, like to introduce the keynote speaker, who is Peter Pitard. Um, Peter Pitard is a Czech politician, political scientist, 
uh, uh, lawyer and has a long history of seeing our issue from all angles, from the bottom, from the top, as a dissident in the old times and having finished with politics several times actually after <laughs> and then restarted. Uh, Peter Pithard was a close collaborator and friend of uh, Vassalado. He was one of the best known, afterwards, best known uh, dissidents. Luckily he was not known in those days, so he could do the job that was not officially accepted. And um, we've asked Peter Pithard to give a keynote speech on the main themes of our conference. Good afternoon, all dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. It happened that the initiator of this conference, Pavel Seifter, has called me to launch the conference with this speech. This is all of my mandate. I have no other calling. And uh, as it was told, I am outside of politics. I am talking on my own behalf with all the risk it encompasses with all the risk for being too sharp in my formulations or possible mistakes. It contains all my political experience for the past quarter of a century and all my feelings as well, I have to recognize. Sometimes feelings are quite important. The European dialogues of Václav Havel start in rooms where, as his friends and colleagues, we have uh, seen him for the last time. It was on the 2nd of October 2011. And we were feeling that rather than a birthday party, it is a farewell. And this strong personal memory is committing me today not to strive at any price to dig out of the texts and speeches of Asaf Havel a ready-made recipe to solve the present crisis of legitimacy of the Union. And I've read in the past days everything that was written by Václav Havel on this subject. And in the text we will find a strong defense of European integration and a merciless criticism of uh, Czech uh, fearfulness uh, towards the outside world and lack of faith. But even in his famous essay, The Power of the Powerless, there is no guide how to bring the Union closer to citizens who will soon vote, or maybe rather not vote, for the European Parliament. As today the problem, it is not the powerless of Havel, but the indifferent, disoriented and incredulous citizens of the present Union. While the prerequisite for all usable recipes to correct the present uh, crisis situation are citizens who can share their concerns with what goes beyond their private interests. The thick tissue of the civil society was for Hafsal Havel a prerequisite for democratic policy, be it at home or in Europe. It was his main concern as a political thinker and then politician. And it may seem to more than one who is not so informed about Havel's thinking as something trivial, as a, an advice that is not too practical. Citizen, be active. Citizens, be active as a group. But in fact, 
it's something that is less than self-evident, and it's a practical assumption. As a active citizen assumes the existence of the civil society, as Václav Havel would have said, a, if possible, thick tissue of associations and bodies of all kinds, a network where every concern, every interest going beyond the horizon of everyday private interest would find its spot. And besides this uh, surrounding less than evident, this uh, protected and well-built public space, the active citizen is a mere illusion. And if we would be talking today about a crisis of the legitimacy of the bodies of the institutions of the Union, will be, which will be confirmed by a low turnout in the elections to the European Parliament. If this was the case, we would have to think about ways how to constitute and about the powers of these bodies and search there for mistakes and for ways how to correct them. The crisis of legitimacy is being lived, of course, on a different level. Also by different democratic bodies of uh, most of the member states, let's say national parliaments, we are mentioning the crisis of democracy, above all the crisis of the political system of political parties, this prerequisite of the political pluralism and the free competition for the share to power and responsibility. The crisis of legitimacy in the Union has shown quite uh, worryingly in the devaluation of the institute of the referendum, the rerun of the Irish referendum, as, as the Irish citizens took the wrong decision at first, is a true scandal. And recently the banned referendum in Greece from Brussels is the last scandal, the scandal of all scandals. And then Greek prime minister had to go because of this idea of the referendum. Well, Certainly many politicians from Europe and from the member states would find good reasons to undergo such a scandal rather than risk the catastrophe of the implosion of the structures of the Eurozone. But this is something we cannot reconcile ourselves with. In the Czech Republic, this crisis of the political system has manifested, among other things, by the fact that in the last elections, two movements were su successful and they will ultimately, let's hope, try to build their own democratic structure so we can mention the legitimacy of their leadership. So far, they function as a grouping who stand and fall with their leaders, not presidents, but leaders. One of these movements is an irreplaceable member of the government coalition. And the other one is claiming that uh, parliamentary democracy should be, if possible, replaced by direct democracy, a referendum anytime on any subject. And so clueless debates are, dis are being conducted on the crisis of the representative democracy, be it on the European level, but also on the national level, and also mentioning the risks of direct democracy. While returning into the first successful years of Monet, Jean Monnet, European integration, where everything important was without a doubt solved on the intergovernmental level, all decisions were taken without the public, it is not possible today. And in its days, it, the attempt for a non-traditional method of decision-taking has not worked. And I have in mind the Messianic Convention, which was rather a theater full of ostentation rather than a democratic workshop. And it went its way. Two members of the founding members of the Union said no even if nobody was too sure what they were refusing. My personal impression is that in Brussels, very often, as we say in our country, people are too much pushing ahead in less than important matters. 
and very often they were decisions that were the most criticized afterwards, although they may be factually correct. Maybe they went ahead of its time. I think that very often we want to do more quickly what is than what is necessary and realistic, that the politicians and the bureaucratic bodies in Brussels are forcing themselves into dubious activities, maybe to justify their very well remunerated existence, and they give weapons to their opponents. I don't know the situation elsewhere, but you would find most opponents of the Union among those who are irritated by some unfounded directives concerning details in the protection of consumers. Now the big hit is the ban on the Czech butter spread, because it is not butter. Is this ban right? And is it worth it? And how many votes will it bring to the opponents of the Union? We have to be realistic also in eliminating the so-called democratic deficit, because I doubt that this deficit can be eliminated. But I think that gradually we can strive to reduce it, and then we will be able to live with it without the feeling that something has to be done at any price, the sooner the better. For instance, it was a quite a strong experience of disappointment when 10 states aspiring at the turn of the millennium to become members, when they were left out in the so-called regatta. And after a few years, government, governments and parliaments of these states were living in a permanent legislative tsunami. And we were expecting every year the summer scoreboard with anxiety, and we were getting it as we used to in school as children. And we were full of anxiety whether two or three will be left in into the union, maybe even the, the five fastest, the, better, the best candidates. And the question was whether we will belong to, to the first ones. And then all ten were left in. And we had a feeling of an unfair game, or the cluelessness of those who started something and didn't quite know what they are doing and what they want. Some extremely important reforms, especially as far as the functioning of the state of law is concerned, that were promoted only on paper and not really into the life of institutions and the public, were then shown as hasty, not well done, and not well ensured. And we were, we were trying to deceive Brussels, we were trying to deceive ourselves. And these cases of uh, senseless pushing ahead could be mentioned more often. The pace of the enlargement and of the deepening of the Union was too fast and not well thought for. And we should not be doing it in both areas, as this had very bad consequences. And I do think the Eurozone should have been introduced with more care, but this is something that everybody knows today. I think that the Union should do calmly its stock-staking of successes and failures, to put itself into order, to consolidate, to rectify rectifiable errors, to cancel failed rules and bad decisions without fearing that it will lose its face, and certainly not to enter more races with uncertain goals. I would love to understand better what us, yes, us, even today, even if we have been recently acting as an extra in Brussels. So what forces us in Brussels to embrace the unreasonable pace of reforms or changes? And if we add to the pace the impenetrable jargon of Brussels, full of abbreviations and codes and the language that translates everything into economic terms, we will better understand those who will not participate in the European elections this 
initiation. The slang is a sort of identifier of the initiated, but for an ordinary man, it is an insurmountable barrier of arrogance. To be brief, understandable, concise was a major and permanent concern of Václav Havel. He had this exceptional sense for any verbal false lips, and he suffered from the ridiculous clumsiness of the Brussels language, but also from its arrogant haughtiness. As if the people were saying, we do not even pretend that we want you to understand. I know what I'm talking about. When the so-called European Constitution was ready, I, together with a colleague of mine, a Czech journalist living in the in Germany and uh, specializing in European issues, wanted to translate the hundreds of pages of the institution of the Constitution into the 20-page concise readable text. I've never undertaken anything of higher impossibility. That impossibility shows that the authors missed not only the genre of the text, that the text that was to be voted in the referenda was unacceptable. That was clear. When we were half through the translation, the constitution was dropped. We may all need a time out, certainly not when we have to deal with the financial and economic crisis, or certainly not when the Union is looking for its efficient position to the tragical development in Ukraine. But we need it when we discuss what else. When I say time out, I do not mean a break. I mean a sort of distance that we need to take to be able to see the state of the Union, not only from the point of view of the adversaries and critiques, but from the point of view of the helpless and disorientated, those who are powerless, but in a different way than in the times of Havel's dissidency. Whom and about what the commissioners and deputies in Brussels should consult? I hope that not all the political representations of national states are, or where may be, so different to the future of the Union as the local ones. I see a major problem in the Union in the insufficient interest of national parliaments in the Union agenda. There, I am convinced, is the bigger part of the democratic deficit of the Union. It is bigger than in the Brussels bodies. For instance, our Chamber of Deputies, I'm not talking about the Senate, the Chamber of Deputies has been leaving the whole Union agenda to its European Affairs Committee. And in the recent years, it has dealt with less than one-tenth of the agenda in a plenary. The ministers of the government did not go often to Brussels. They used to send their deputies there. And the government was left with little choice than to stereotypically say almost always every, uh, to everything no. And I believe that it will change now. I'm getting back to the active citizen and the civil society of Václav Havel. The citizen today is not powerless, and he doesn't need to fight for the paradoxical power described by Václav Havel in his famous essay on the power of the powerless. It was the power held by the powerless people willing to bring sac sacrifices, not only material, but also the sacrifice of freedom for their attitudes. The citizen today is powerless in a different way. He doesn't want to join political parties, and if he participates in 
the elections, he usually chooses the risky non-systemic movements rather than the distrusted political parties. He is powerless because he doesn't know where he should use his share of power he holds. He doesn't know why to vote. He doesn't know whom to vote for. He doesn't understand the European agenda. It's not his mistake. It is the mistake of the European politicians, starting with the deputies who deal with the agenda without being able to explain what they do in an understandable and visible manner. A real political process is missing. And instead, we can guess that there are invisible pressures, influence, pledges, threats, something against something. But a real choice between real alternatives, different in the values they are proposing, are missing. However, civil society is not and doesn't need to be powerless. Here, it is far from being what Havel used to call a dense tissue spontaneously created as diverse as possible and not commanded from one place. But there have been new possibilities that popped up recently. I wouldn't like to speak too early, but we may be witnessing in the Czech Republic the implementation of one unique project, a plan of 20 non-governmental organizations that about two years ago agreed to cooperate. They called their unique anti-corruption project of citizens, businessmen and politicians state reconstruction, according to the name of one of these organizations. They elaborated drafts of nine key acts that should help us to eliminate the worst possible phenomenon that is the omnipresent corruptive behavior. They invested the efforts and systematically visited the candidates of political parties and movements and finally got from most of them a written pledge that if they were elected, they will vote in favor of these acts. If not, they will be in public disgrace. And it is happening right now. It is not possible that 100% of the project is implemented. Of course, the chamber has the right to modify the drafts, but the adoption process of these acts has been progressing at an unbelievable pace. I repeat, we must not speak too early, but it seems that it is an unexpected success, not only because there is the cooperation of the 20 entities, it was a good idea, but especially because behind the project there is enormous amount of work, of two years of work, of enthusiasts, but also invited experts, professionals. But the global situation of civil society and the Czech Republic is far from being satisfactory. At the beginning of the 90s, it looked more promising. But then some very influential politicians from both the right and the left declared war to civil society, not to the individual parts of the civil society, but to the whole concept of it. It was a war at all the fronts. And then Václav Havel and Václav Klaus fought many battles for the very substance of modern democracy. For Klaus, civil society was an attack against political pluralism, parliamentarism, against political parties, because he said, if, because he said active citizens usurp a mandate that can be got only in elections. If anybody wants to change anything, he should join a political party or found his own. I believe that it was and still is a betrayal of the liberal and conservative principles too, because an I the ideal of the state that is not uselessly strong is thinkable only if there is strong civil society. Václav Havel would probably 
welcome the joint activity of the non-governmental organizations headed by Rekonstrukce Státu and Ekologický právní servis. And I think that he would start reflecting whether anything like that could work at the European level too. There is a couple of significant non-governmental organizations that work across the borders, such as Transparency International, Amnesty International, European Citizens Initiative, Greenpeace. What else is left then as a real untested option? Of course, we will see the continuation of what is happening, that is the both spontaneous and organized search of what is usually called the sense of the union, the soul of the union, the values on which it is or should be built, the big story of the union, the narrative of the union. That means we'll continue searching for the things that will help the member countries and the citizens understand that we need something more solidary and more coherent than what we have today. No objections, but I would not rely too much on these verbal efforts. For instance, the desired new story, new narrative of Europe. I believe that it cannot be invented. A story is something that had happened, not something that can be discovered at a desk. If it is to be a story, a true story that people will pass on. In such a case, a story must be connected to a sacrifice, and you cannot put, put a sacrifice on stage, you cannot invent it. And the same applies to our values. Values are not noble, impressive words, but they are the result of a painful choice when, in a real situation, not at a conference, people decide that they will sacrifice something less valuable to something more valuable. Values, in fact, are nothing else than prioritization of the less precious and more precious. They are priorities agreed on after a difficult decision on what should be sacrificed to what, not after a debate between philosophers and historians on the roots of European civilization. It's not the result of our memories we keep of our past, it's the identification and decision about the current alternatives. I think that one such alternative is there ahead of us, and we pretend that it does not exist. Should the Union actively fight social and other dumping of the developing economies, or should it, in the, the interest of its GDP growth, give it up and give up what distinguishes it from the rest of the world? Should it enter in the name of neoliberal values the free competition with those who do not know for the time being what are social rights, rights of individuals and, and minorities, nature protection, cultural landscape? In other words, should the decision in the interest of its GDP and economic growth compete with those who produce more cheaply because also they do not care about the things that are so dear to us, the Europeans? This is a real dilemma. This is the situation of choice when it is really decided what are and what are not or will not be European values. It is the situation when we decide what we are willing to sacrifice and what we are not. Such choices will give rise to real stories, but such decisions are not taken at the meeting of specialists in the spiritual history of the continent. So what could and should inspire Brussels policy of the Union, what space, what platforms are available. The Parliament in Strasbourg will get support of 20, 30 percent of voters who will participate in the elections, but there will be more voters this time who will want to dissolve the Union. 
there are no political parties at the European level for the time being, even if we register the first partial attempts to set them up, and there is no need to play these attempts down. On the contrary, as I said, referendum is taboo. If a referendum took place today in the Czech Republic, we cannot exclude that the winning opinion would be to get out from the Union. As for the convent and other engineered top-down monstrous events are out of play today. So what is left is the coordinated efforts of the active citizens who want to create their own new space and fill the space not only with their preoccupations and rest of enthusiasm, but also with professional expert work. They want to come one day with suggestions of probably not how to reconstruct the union, but how to redefine the priorities. I'm not going to say redefinitions of the uh, goals, because the goals fortunately are still open. Is it really economic priorities and at what price? And the citizens then will come after a deep discussion with this suggestion and will engage the candidates to the European parliaments in this process. I think that we will not be able to do it before the forthcoming elections. But if the young, educated Europeans do not do it, if they are not willing to meet for dialogue similar to those to the one we have here, who will do it? There are many ways out of the legitimacy, coherence and intelligibility crisis of the Union, but not all of them are practicable. Interconnecting civil societies across the continent is one of them. And it has one major advantage, or rather a guarantee. If it happens, we can be sure that there will be not behind it any aspirations to get a position of power or the unreasonably high remuneration in Brussels. The only thing that will be behind will be the genuine, idealistically motivated will to save, to revive the unique and wonderful enterprise which, despite all the troubles and crises, the Union still is. Today's Prague European Dialogue is not the first or the last event of this type. What it will bring, whether it will bring anything new, inspiring or stimulating, we do not know. It could become space, especially for the younger educated generation, for those who will then take the dialogue that starts today here in Prague and will take it to Europe. They will create space, itinerating space, created from the bottom, flexible, adaptable. It will be a sort of convention with a small K. And then it will be connected with the efficient help of the social networks with the most viable elements of the already existing civil societies of the member countries. And then it will be connected to what exists already at the multinational level. If we have today multinational groups, why shouldn't we have multinational civil society? And maybe it is really high time for anything like that. We see the Union as an imperfect work, but at the same time we see that for millions of Ukrainians are erroneous but still orderly and civilized and unifying Europe is something like a haven, a target, and there are people there who are willing to give their life for it. I think that for us it is a very unexpected and obliging motivation, and we have to act in a generous and responsible way.
a discussion. Following what we've heard now, we'll meet tonight uh, at 7 o'clock and there will be time to discuss individual issues. Uh, now I would like uh, to ask all of us to, uh, to start immediately with the, with the uh, conference itself. The first session, which is Europe, about Europe and the crisis of democratic uh, capitalism, I would like to invite uh, Yuri Pehe, the moderator, and the speakers 